Welcome to Northern Arizona, the Marble Canyon area around Lee's Ferry, the start of the Grand Canyon. Um, it's a nice, calm morning here. We're getting ready this morning to head out on our Grand Canyon River trip, but I thought I'd get up early um, and check out a couple other geologic locations that you might be interested in, explain them the best I can. Thanks for joining me. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey, and we're on the road heading in towards Lee's Ferry. Uh, this is looking to the east towards Lee's Ferry. Uh, this kind of wide opening in the topography uh, where the Grand Canyon River trips start. And from this point on, uh, the river cuts through the lighter rocks you see here, the Kaibab limestone, a Permian Age limestone. And this is the start of Marble Canyon and the effective start of the Grand Canyon, which runs uh, through this landscape for another 220 or so miles downstream. Um, we're also looking here at the uh, Vermilion Cliffs. So this cliff section here is part of the Grand Staircase, a whole sequence of layered, mostly horizontal, sedimentary rocks uh, from the Triassic, the Jurassic, uh, and the Grand Staircase runs even from older time periods in the Paleozoic up through the Cretaceous. But up here we've got uh, some of the Wingate and Navajo sandstone uh, sitting on the Chinle Formation, which forms a kind of uh, uh, kind of gray and purple badland deposits here. But our main focus with this video is going to be uh, this little section of cliff. And then most interestingly, right here along the road are these really amazing balanced rocks that are perched on these small pedestals. Um, and so I thought we'd just look at these in detail. Uh, I've got a little drawing that I'll use to, to supplement this a little bit. And then, um, yeah, see where we can go from there. There's two really nice ones here right by the road. There's this one here. Uh, this rock is, oh boy, probably... 20 feet by almost 15 or so feet, at least in this dimension. Um, so maybe uh, six or seven meters tall and maybe about five to six meters in width. If we get up here close and try to figure these things out, I think even from this vantage point, you can see that there's two different rock types that we have here. We have this reddish unit below and then where the boulder starts with this contact, we have a different looking unit above. So let's look at these in a little bit of detail and see if we can make some sense. We've got this red unit here, which as I'm touching it is pretty smooth to the touch. So the grain size of this sedimentary rock uh, would be mud size, you know, silts and clays. It's not sandy to the touch. It's much finer than that. Uh, it's got these conspicuous white stripes cutting across it. As I look at these closely, um, I can see that they're somewhat kind of fibrous. They've got little lines going up and down perpendicular to the stripes here. These are veins and these particular veins are gypsum. So gypsum veins, um, gypsum is a soft mineral. So if I get in here with my fingernail, if you, how well you can see that, you can actually scratch it with your fingernail. So it's a very soft material. It's used to make drywall sheetrock. So it's in your home, most likely. Um, and so this is the Moenkopi Formation. This is a Triassic unit of red mudstones, um, a few sandstones, but mostly red mudstones and some gypsum. And the depositional environment, the, the location or the setting in which this unit was deposited was a tidal flat. There's places where this unit has uh, symmetrical ripple marks that go up and down uh, along the bedding surfaces. And so you can imagine a, a very low relief area adjacent to the coastline where the tide comes in and the tide goes out and that shapes uh, the surface into these uh, ripple marks that we see in places, which I don't see any here, but we could look around and see if we could find any. Um, and then the gypsum would be any sort of environment in which you have high amounts of evaporation. So you're probably pretty close to sea level and you're... Um, creating very arid conditions where the seawater is evaporating and that can turn some of the material into gypsum. And so in this case, the gypsum is actually some of that seawater after the mud's been deposited has infiltrated the rock along fractures or cracks and then evaporated to form these evaporite deposits we call gypsum. So that's what makes up the base or the pedestal of our little balanced rock.
If we come over here to the contact and look at the big boulder, the more massive rock that's up above, uh, what we can see is there's, as we touch it, it's much more coarse grained. We can actually see some of the individual particles here. A lot of uh, pebble sized particles, you know, maybe about as big as uh, an inch or a few centimeters in diameter, but generally in the, in the pebble range, uh, mostly a sandy type material, lots of good rounding in the particles. So as we look at some of these particles, we can see uh, they're pretty well rounded. Uh, and so this is a conglomerate. I guess it's sort of a sandstone conglomerate hybrid um, throughout this unit. We can also see in places, you might be able to pick out a little bit of bedding in this unit, some layering as well. We'll see if we can find a few more uh, outcrops that show that. Again, the nice contact between the two, between the, the boulder and the little pedestal here. And we can see another one down the way here. So what we have here is this interesting outcrop creating these balanced rocks. As we look back to the north, we can see the same two rock types forming this mesa here. The reddish unit forming, oh boy, a good three quarters of the slope here is the Moenkopi formation, the soft mudstones with a little bit of gypsum in it. And then capping the unit across the top of the mesa is a little bit more brown unit. And that's the Shinnerump conglomerate. This is actually the basal part of what's known as the Chin Li formation. Both of these units are Triassic in age. Um, but uh, the Chin Li is about probably like 210 million years old. Moen Kopi is probably like about 240. So the big question here in terms of processes would be, well, how do we get these cool little balance rocks uh, in this situation? What's the process? And let me walk you through a quick diagram I have to explain it. So if we start with this situation here, where we have a mesa with the Shinnerump conglomerate, on top of the softer Moen Kopi formation. And let's allow processes to dislodge parts of the Shinnerum conglomerate. So that could be things like frost wedging, water getting in the fractures and freezing in the winter time. Could be maybe a regional earthquake. Something dislodges these big boulders. They tumble down off the cliff and down onto the slope. So now we've got this big boulder of conglomerate sitting on the Moen Kopi formation down here along the, this flat area here. And we're in the Colorado Plateau region of uh, northern Arizona where they get a lot of flash floods, where there's a lot of heavy thunderstorm activity that can take place, especially in the late part of summertime. And notice that the, the Moen Kopi formation in this area, there's no vegetation. I don't see, well, okay, I got one little bush here, but for the most part, there's like no vegetation, no trees, no grasses. Um, to absorb some of that moisture when they get these, these big flooding events. And so we've seen that these conglomerates are much harder. That's why they're capping the mesa. This sandstone conglomerate unit uh, is much more resistant to weathering than the Moen Kopi formation, which is quite soft. So what happens is as we get the rain here, is this conglomerate's protecting uh, the Moen Kopi formation beneath it. The erosion is happening along the edges here of the conglomerate. And so over time we get the situation we see here where we have this little pedestal of Moen Kopi formation and it's capped by this large boulder of conglomerate uh, and a little person there for scale. So this is how we get these little balance rocks. The ultimate fate of these, of course, is ultimately you weather so much of the, the pedestal with successive thunderstorm events and erosion that eventually you um, create an imbalance where the conglomerate falls off or you just completely weather away the pedestal uh, and then you're back to square one. You're, then you're back to this situation where it's just going to start forming a new pedestal uh, and a new little balance drop. So hopefully that's kind of helpful there. Um, I thought we'd like walk around a bit and look at a few of the outcrops. This, this is a nice boulder here that shows uh, a much more sort of true conglomerate, I suppose. So in this particular boulder, you can see more of the individual class of rock. Again, these, you know, inch or so diameter particles, mostly quartzites, it looks like to me, some chert, um, very well rounded. So these would all be stream deposits. These would all be uh, ma material that was transported down a stream. And during the Triassic, the, the Western US was not very mountainous. It was the low area. The bigger mountains were to the east in uh, East Texas, 
uh, North Texas, that area. And so those mountains were shedding off sediment and rivers were transporting those, um, that sediment westward or northwestward across northern Arizona. And so these were the big river systems that were carrying uh, that material. This unit, the Chinle Formation, is also well known for uh, the petrified logs and petrified wood that it contains at places like Petrified Forest National Park. And so these were the stream systems that transported those logs, um, rafted those logs along in the streams and eventually became some of that petrified wood we see in those areas. Um, so let's just walk around just a bit here to uh, wrap this up. Um, looks like you can see here, again, the contact between the Moen Kopi formation and um, the Shinarump conglomerate, another big boulder over here. So in this landscape, you can see there's various um, stages of development from, you know, the pedestals that are pretty well developed, I guess, maybe at the mature stage, that one, you know, will last, who knows, maybe a few hundred years or so. Um, all the way to ones that are still sort of developing, like this one straight up here. Let's head up here where you can see the boulder directly resting on Moenkopi Formation outcrop. And at least part of the boulder is on the slope, but the rest of the boulder on this, uh, I guess, north or south side is being undercut and it's starting to erode away so there's a a pedestal in the works in the process uh starting to take place there so you can see the heavy erosion especially on this right side where this gully starting to form some of the outcrop of the moan Kopi, the big boulder of shinarump conglomerate there and then more erosion on this side so as we get more thunderstorms and more erosion it's going to wear the gullies down down on each side creating an isolated little pinnacle um, or little pedestal if you will um, that will eventually look like some of these other ones down here um, so you can see these just in various states some are higher up on the slope uh, others are down here in the flats now let's finish with this one this one's just kind of this one's like the perfect little example. Smaller boulder than this first one we looked at, but still a great example uh, and a much narrower little pinnacle or pedestal beneath the boulder itself. And then you can see the one to the right here next to it. Um, probably the way it's oriented, well, who knows because it came down the hill, but my guess is that one's already collapsed off a pedestal um, and is in the process of maybe reforming. Although it's going to be a little bit more challenging just because of the way it's, it's oriented and the way its weight is somewhat distributed. Um, but this one here is pretty neat. So, yeah, more of the Moenkopi formation at the bottom. Uh, the gypsum beds crisscrossing through the unit here. Uh, and then as we look up to the contact with the overlying Shinarump conglomerate part of the Chin Li formation, we can see that as well. So really nice, just maybe a quick walk around and then we'll head off to more diverse locations. Yeah, very fun. Just a scenic little spot. The, the sun's just barely starting to hit the Vermilion Cliffs over here sunrise so awesome well thanks for joining me hopefully that was helpful some of the cool balanced rocks you see here there's a couple stretches between here and Kanab where you can see these right along the highway highway 89 um right next to the road there's a place called cliff dwellers i'm here um, between marble canyon and lee's ferry but any place you see the moen kopi formation beneath the shinarup conglomerate it's a good place for these types of little pedestal rocks to form so Thanks for joining me again. Appreciate all you can do uh, for support. There's a donate button on the banner of the YouTube page. Uh, make sure you like, sh share, subscribe. All those things help uh, grow the page, help me reach more folks that might be interested. Um, you, there's also a PayPal link under the description for the video. And finally, there's a thanks button uh, near the bottom right of the YouTube viewer. And that's another way you can donate as well. So for now, thanks for joining me from Marble Canyon, the beginning of the Grand Canyon here in Northern Arizona.